In recent weeks, various Omicron variants have dominated COVID transmission across the United States. The newest one, XBB 1.5, poses a unique risk to the population as it has more than doubled its share of the COVID-19 pie in the last four weeks, accounting for 41 percent of all new infections in December. Virologists warn that this variant has the potential to drive a new COVID surge. Nearly three years after the pandemic began and two years after the development of vaccines, new COVID variants still continue to develop. And growing evidence suggests repeated vaccinations might make people more susceptible to the new variant and could be fueling the virus's rapid evolution. Joining us now to discuss this is virologist, immunologist, and assistant professor at Emory University, Mihul Sutar. Welcome. Thank you very much. So I guess my first question would be, um, did forcing people to get vaccinated over and over end up harming us? No, not at all. I think uh, what we're seeing here is as this virus continues to uh, evolve, uh, and this is mainly because uh, the virus continues to transmit, uh, spread in populations, the virus has the ability to change over time to sort of increase its transmissibility. One of the uh, uh, things that happens with the virus is that it accumulates these mutations, which uh, end up evading antibody responses. Uh, but no, I do not think it's because of repeated vaccinations that uh, fuels these variants. Can you help us understand uh, what the predictions are about the relevance of this new variant? Because it does seem like there are periodically reports of new variants that take over the share of the COVID pie, as, as we put it, um, that dominate over others, but they don't necessarily always seem to manifest in spikes in hospitalizations or some of the indicators that we're going through another kind of surge or an amplification in the crisis. So is it necessarily a problem that it's just a different vi a strain of the virus taking over or you know is there evidence that this particular strain is going to be more harmful or any other kinds of downstream side effects but I think we're still trying to figure out whether this particular strain is going to be more harmful because I think it's still in the early days uh, but I think it's uh, different than what we've seen in the past with some of the omicron variants when the original omicron variant emerged last year uh, we had just begun giving booster vaccines uh, people were getting them. Uh, but also a majority of the uh, population, I think greater than 90 percent now from a har recent Harvard study has shown that uh, many individuals have had, had at least one exposure uh, to SARS-CoV-2. Uh, with this particular variant, uh, we not only have multiple booster, we have a bivalent booster. Uh, more than likely, individuals have had hybrid immunity, which is a combination of infection and vaccine-induced immunity. And also we have uh, tools like Paxlovid at our disposal to help reduce uh, disease severity and, and time uh, at which we have a high viral load. So we have lots of tools compared to what we did a year ago, but this particular XBB variant as well as a BQ variant that's also dominating as well, uh, have, additional, have accumulated additional mutations that uh, further put strain on the vaccines that we have generated. Uh, the bivalent vaccine was generated against one strain called BA5, which was at the time that that bivalent booster was uh, deployed. That was the dominating strain. Now we've kind of gone a little bit further away with the XBB variant. Yeah. Okay. So go, go ahead, ahead Bria. Oh, I was going to say, forgive me if this is um, a stupid question, but I think at least one of our viewers will have the same question as me. So I'm going to go ahead and ask it. Um, uh, if this if this variant ends up being um, more dangerous, having harsher symptoms than an earlier variant, and this mutation came, you know, as a result of the fact that uh, somebody got bo we we many of us got boosted, many people got boosted for uh, an earlier variant, right? Um, aren't we producing a more dangerous variant by getting these continued boosters? And wouldn't that be a reason to sort of stop doing i mean what 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 are a what what is get to be gained from the boosters and b how come they aren't um seen as in some way uh, putting us at risk so uh, as i said i i don't think booster vaccinations are helping to fuel these new variants uh what we previously had was a monovalent booster dose which was against that original ancestral spike protein uh what we have uh, accumulated over the last year with these Omicron variants are mutations that go further and further away from that ancestral spike, meaning that we needed to update that vaccine 
to help combat some of these new Omicron sublineages. This is the same kind of formula that's used uh, every year with the flu vaccine when we have to update the flu vaccine uh, to sort of match the current circulating strain. Except with SARS-CoV-2, everything is much more condensed. Everything's happening at such a rapid pace and at a global pace as well. And so with the BA5 bivalent booster, it has many of the same mutations that are present in this XBB variant. So you're helping to train your immune system and starting to generate some of these antibodies that can now protect you against some of these emerging variants. But the one thing I'll mention is that while vaccines tend to take uh, 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 an important point in terms of, you know, are these variants being fueled by these vaccines? I don't think so. But I think one thing that has to be kept in mind is that multiple repeated infections are also not a viable strategy as well. Because what we're learning more and more is that anytime someone gets uh, an additional set of infections, it increases your risk of hospitalization, but it also increases the risk of uh, long COVID or post-acute sequelae that we're still learning about. One, two, or three infections, you tend to get an increased risk of these post-acute sequelae. Yeah, I'm, I'm sympathetic to people who look at what's being recommended, rec recommended, excuse me, with respect to a vaccination schedule and a booster schedule and say, you know, the, there is increasing evidence that we don't know what's really going to happen. And there's some downstream side effects from, especially in certain populations, younger men, et cetera, for getting consecutive vaccines and boosters for the, to the end of their life. And that maybe we should have had different kinds of um, recommendations about who should and who shouldn't be vaccinated or boosted um, in various age ranges and risk levels, and, et cetera. But I also really take your point that the same kinds of risks that present um, in marginally in the population for consecutive vaccinations and boosts present for people who consecutively catch COVID. And that really seems to have put people in a catch-22 where you're kind of picking your poison. And I wonder what you make of what interventions could have been helpful here. I saw a study recently that showed in France they're really pushing to focus on air quality so that whether or not people boost or, vaccine or, or vaccinate, um, they're able to have less susceptibility to the vaccine because, it's, uh, sorry, to the, the virus because it's just less prominent in the air. Do you think that because of the risks that are presenting from both catching COVID over and over again and in some parts of the population getting vaccinated consecutively, that there should be more of a focus on prevention, masking, social distancing, air quality, things like that? I, I think those are tools that we can always use. I, I think in areas where you see increases in infections, we start to see these surges of infection. I think using better air quality, you know, having better systems that purify the air, uh, using masking, social distancing, I think help in preventing infections. Um, they're not always 100%, but they're just tools that we can use at our disposal to help reduce our risk of getting infected, especially in high-risk settings. Um, I think uh, what we know about vaccines is that they were never intended to protect against infection. Uh, they're really designed to help reduce the risk of uh, severe disease, hospitalizations, and death. And, and the record has shown that that's what these vaccines are doing. Uh, but as we get further and further away from the original ancestral virus, I think uh, using these bivalent boosters uh, will help uh, in further protecting us against uh, severe disease, hospitalization, and death. Hmm. Uh, Professor, were there any um, recommendations that were made in earlier variants that you feel now um, should not be made? Were there any um, uh, policy decisions that were made vis-a-vis -vis COVID, vis-a-vis -vis boosters, vis-a-vis -vis vaccines that you think now at this stage we've learned better um, and, and, and should not be employed now or should not have been employed then? I think what was done previously is perfectly fine. I think moving forward, I think uh, what would help uh, the public is that, uh, and, and again, these things take years to develop, uh, is being able to uh, uh, develop vaccines that can drive more durable or longer lasting immune uh, responses so that we're not dealing with uh, situations where we have to get boosters every three to six months. I don't think anyone's, I think many people are not in favor of that. I think everyone would love to have a booster that maybe would pair well with when you get a flu vaccine. Uh, and that way you can get both at the same time. Um, but I think these are things that are still in development.
Yeah, Doctor, I just had one last question for you. We were talking earlier about um, the relationship, if there's any at all, between um, new variants and vaccination rates, et cetera. And my understanding is that there, you, you say there's no connection there. Isn't it true that part of what's going on with the creation of these new variants is that variants are able to manifest when there's large parts of the population that are not vaccinated and also catching the disease a lot so it can incubate. And that's part of the reason why there was um, so, so much criticism about the short-sightedness of the policy that said large parts of the world were not going to have access to the vaccine at all until 2023, 2024. Yeah, I think um, one thing that we always have to keep in mind is that this is a global problem. This is not just a problem within the United States. It's not a problem within a, a certain country. While we can solve a problem within the United States by, you know, getting high vaccination rates, uh, not having high vaccination rates or even booster vaccines in other parts of the world. Uh, it's uh, We clearly see that these variants can spread quite rapidly, uh, either within the United States or uh, in other parts of the world as well. Mm. Well, thank you so much for joining us uh, today, doctor. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. We'll have more rising for you right after this. <laughs>